Do you, you found the skeleton? How would you, how tell, how would you tell, tell them that? Person? You first, first, first. How would you tell them Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today I'm going to be talking about the newish president of the Institute for Creation Research, ICR, Dr. Randy Galuzzo. No idea if I'm pronouncing that right. Randy is a bit controversial, even among other young Earth creationists, because he says not only that natural selection isn't sufficient to explain evolution, but that it doesn't exist at all. You may not be surprised to hear this, but basically no one outside of ICR agrees with him. He's giving a talk here, I think in a church, but it doesn't really matter. I'm skipping past the intro bit, and here we go. What's the take home message from Dr. Clary's talk? There's, a, there's, there's several. This is presumably a reference to an earlier talk. I'm including it for context. But if you were to come up to one person and say, I know, I know of a research institution that is doing some research that nobody else on the planet is doing. No secular, no creationist group, none of them. They're taking borehole logs from where? All over the world by the thousands and they are cataloging the layers that you see i'd point out that that's fine but it's not like in most places the geology is unstudied look up a stratigraphic map of any location it's usually pretty detailed granted there are areas where less work has been done than others but i'm not sure if dr glue is trying to imply that this work is revolutionary if he is it sure doesn't sound like it and what do we find we find evidence of a global flood because we find the same layers on how many continents? All of them in the same order. But are they flood layers? Because it's not really super hard to tell if rock was deposited by a flood. For instance, if it's windborne sand, then the answer is no. And we have such sandstone layers across the globe. The reason for the consistent ordering in many places is simple. Supercontinents. Explain that. I feel like I just did. So what Dr. Cleary is putting together is he's, he's, not just, he's not just pushing back against evolution. What Dr. Cleary is doing, he's giving you a better explanation to pull a bunch of observations together into a narrative that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, as long as you don't think about it for more than like 30 seconds. That is really, really good evidence for a catastrophic worldwide flood wrong that happened recently no and happened rapidly not even close now we've been really lacking in biology we don't have a unifying narrative interestingly this seems to tie into icr's recent logo change they used to use a stylized depiction of the bohr model of the atom and they were focused mainly on physical sciences like geology and nuclear physics here's what dr kaluza had to say about it ICR's most pressing assignment is to fundamentally change the way that people understand biology. Our task is to construct a completely new theory of biological design that incorporates recent discoveries and respects the biblical narrative. The theory would explain hundreds of fascinating examples of creatures' abilities, and from an organism-centered, engineering-based perspective, that gives glory to the creator, and not to nature. We hope this theory will become the fundamental design-based principle uniting biological explanations in Christian textbooks and museums educating future generations of young believers. We pray that an engineering-based approach to biology will spark a second creationist revival and once again stir up a sense of certainty in Christian truth. So basically, Randy's big goal is to once and for all figure out biology without evolution, which, good luck with that. We've been doing a lot of hole punching in evolution for a long time, but we haven't come up with our own explanation of how things in biology are actually working. I'm not aware of any actual problems in evolution that were first proposed by post LNG white creationists. And I put the caveat in there that because she and the Seventh-day Adventists rather invented young earth creationism, and then people like Duane T. Gish and Henry Morris ran with it, creating the ICR in the first place, and from there it spawned other organizations and ministries like Creation Ministries International and Answers in Genesis, etc., creationists, as we might now call them, in the 19th century largely died out during the 20th century, and the current crop reject most of their ideas, such as progressive creation and the gap theory, etc. And I hate to say a lot of our hole punching in evolution hasn't really been effective. Well, that's the understatement of the year. In fact, I hate to say our pushback against evolution has been, we accept your evolutionary narrative, it just can't do everything you claim. 
I will say, it is abusing the degree to which modern creationism has been backed into the corner of accepting virtually every basic fact about evolution, because they're all so obviously true. That has been the, that has been the extent of our pushback. Everything you're saying is right about how evolution works, except it just can't do everything you say it can do. Now, is that really a good pushback? Rhetorically, no, but it does have the advantage of not being completely wrong. It's a terrible pushback. When you, when, you guarantee, when, you, when you give away the evolutionary narrative, what you're saying, the mutations happen. Okay, if he goes for mutations don't happen, that'll be amazing, since scientists can watch mutations happen and record them. This isn't a question. What you're saying is nature is some mystical selector which can favor some and disfavor others. Nope, no one is saying that. Nature is more like a sieve. It exists and retains some things while letting other things simply get weeded out without any intentionality. If it's too big to fit through the holes, it stays. If not, it's gone. Now granted, the sieve itself was designed by someone, and that person probably had some design criteria in mind, but the important thing is that no one thinks that the actual sieve itself was selecting what will remain in it. And honestly, if you want to just say that the designer of the sieve is analogous to God, then sure, I don't really care. In other words, nature is really crafting life, but it can't just craft it as much as you say it can craft. You know what they say? Checkmate. Basically, yeah, creationists have never made headway in biology. In fact, most of what they say that contradicts biology could be shown to be nonsense with little more than an introductory biology course for undergrads. What we're saying is, you're wrong on everything. Your narrative is wrong from the beginning. That's a bold strategy, Randy. Let's see if it pays off. Your narrative is wrong. That's where our, that's where our new evidence is coming in. Mutations aren't the mechanism. And we are going to flat out totally reject once and for all, all personifications of nature where you roll in a bunch of magic into your biology because you have to come up with a substitute creator because you don't want to have and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, a couple things here. First, anytime I catch Randy personifying anything he doesn't think is personal, I now get to call it out. Because frankly, personification is just a basic aspect of human communication. If I look at a cloud and I say, I wonder if it'll decide to rain. I'm not actually thinking the cloud has a mind, it's just that since most of what I communicate with has minds, it's an easy way to talk. As if things I do not think have minds do. Second, there are plenty of evolutionary biologists who are Christians. This is not a fight between Jesus and the forces of darkness. And so when you personify nature, when you project onto nature this selective ability, you are projecting onto nature intelligence and volition. No, you're not. Let's look at how a few places define natural selection. Google defines it as the process whereby organisms better adapt to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. The theory of its action was first fully expounded by Charles Darwin and is now believed to be the main process that brings about evolution. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. Dictionary.com says it's, quote, the process by which forms of life having traits that better enable them to adapt to specific environmental pressures as predators change in climate or competition for food or mates, will tend to survive and reproduce in greater numbers than those of other kinds, thus ensuring the perpetuation of those favorable traits in succeeding generations. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. The American Museum of Natural History says this, quote, In its essence, it is a simple statement about rates of reproduction and mortality. Those individuals who happen to be the best suited to an environment survive and reproduce most successfully, producing many similarly well-adapted descendants. After numerous breeding cycles, the better adapted dominate. Nature has filtered out poorly suited individuals and the population has evolved. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. Wikipedia says that, quote, natural selection is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there either. OpenStax, a free open college textbook resource, in their second edition biology text refers to it as, quote, reproduction of individuals with favorable genetic traits that survive environmental change because of those traits leading to evolutionary change. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. So basically, whether it be in a dictionary, a textbook, or an encyclopedia, everyone agrees that it is simply a matter of differential reproductive success and that no particular volition or intelligence is needed. Is that not what it takes to make a selection? Yes, it takes intelligence and a will to make a selection. And I'm sorry that things are poorly named in science, but guess what? Up quarks aren't higher than down quarks. Dark energy isn't black, and the peacock mantis shrimp isn't a peacock, a mantis, or a shrimp. Dinosaurs aren't lizards, 
and apparently not every member of Homo sapiens can actually think as the name implies. I don't know what to tell you except that using argument from etymology is to strawman your intellectual opponents. Don't you exercise intelligence and volition when you make a selection? Yep, and congratulations, you found where the selection analogy breaks down. Because all analogies must at some point. That doesn't really mean anything, though. So when I project it onto nature, I am projecting onto nature godlike abilities. Yes, and the easy solution that everyone else figured out over a century ago is to just not do that. And since nature is operating everywhere, and as Darwin says, nature is scrutinizing every creature all the time, saving those things which are good, selecting those, and building with them, you have just projected onto nature agency. I mean, yeah, because agency isn't the same thing as personhood, volition, or intelligence. Unintelligent, impersonal agents do things all the time. The hot water scalded Teddy. What's the agent in that sentence? Well, it's the hot water. What did it do? It scalded. Who is the patient? Well, it's Teddy. Grammatically, we English speakers encode agents with the subject role. So anytime you use a noun referring to something that isn't a person as the subject of a verb, you're allowing impersonal things to be agents. Now, in case you're wondering, no, we're not going to get into ergativity or tripartite alignment. And if that makes no sense to you, then don't worry about it. Your life will probably be simpler without trying to make sense of that stuff. Godlike agency. And it is flat out idolatrous. Even if that were happening, since in most versions of Christian theology, God is directly sustaining the world, the acts of nature remain acts of God, even if the two are still distinguishable. So from the perspective of us here in the natural world, if there's a God, we actually should expect nature to act in some ways as if it has volition. So even if we pretend that natural selection gives nature godlike power in the Abrahamic sense of God, that's not a contradiction nor is it necessarily blasphemous. I mean, think about a Christian farmer praying for rain. If it comes and he ascribes that action to God, even though we can all see the meteorology and it looks perfectly normal, do we say that farmer is being blasphemous? I don't know anyone who would say that. We're going to show you, that's right, it is. It's out, it's out. How the Lord Jesus Christ built into these creatures abilities right from the very beginning right from the very beginning, to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. This is what he wanted them to do. Now that will be interesting. So, we have a model, and we're going to go through this here. The screen is intentionally black, because it's quiz time. Quiz time, quiz time. Yesterday, I know I recognized the faces, so I know you were here. <laughs> um, uh, I said there was the most important part of my lecture. I want you to stop seeing creatures as what? Um, part of nature? I don't know. I wasn't here last time. Oh, so all of those of you who practice your lip reading said, he just said, passive modeling clay. Well, that's not how I'd have described things. So I guess mission accomplished on this one? I want you to stop seeing creatures as passive modeling clay being shaped by what? nature, nature, and I want you to see them as active, problem-solving entities which take on environmental challenges, solve them, and fill the earth. I'm not sure that these things are mutually exclusive. I mean, we know that many organisms can solve problems, and depending on your definition, it might be most or all. In order to take on those challenges, creatures must track the environment. The environment changes. The environment doesn't cause them. It detects, oops, I give it away. It detects the change, and it, it self-adjusts. Well, that's just phenotypic plasticity. Organisms with the same genome can end up with different traits as a result of their environment. All you need to do to see this is look at identical twins with different upbringings. They are usually not identical. They can vary significantly in height, build, and weight. This isn't news to biologists, nor is it something that's ignored. Therefore, in order to do that, all adaptable things must have three and key elements. Those elements are what? To detect, you must have a sensor. You know what evolutionists call them? Receptors. Hmm, why do they call them receptors? Because they physically receive chemicals, so as to signal the presence of those chemicals to the cell on which the receptor sits. But let's hear the conspiracy theory version of this ordinary explanation. 
because they see organisms as what? Passive. Passive. Yeah, every biologist looks at a cheetah chasing down a gazelle and thinks that's the height of passivity. But what they really are is they're active sensors. On a macroscopic scale, some things are active sensors, like the chemoreception, aka smell organs, of tetrapods, which have to have air within transcends actively brought to them in most cases, or samples of the aromatics in the air taken with the tongue and brought to the sensors in the case of monitor lizards and snakes. But the actual proteins on the cells that detect the scents are still passive receptors. It's not as if simple organisms are either actively or passively sensing their environment. In many cases, it's both. Next, they must have what? Innate logic, if then logic. If you detect this, then deploy this, and they have to have output responses. Well, yes and no. They need to have that to actually react to the stimuli, but there's no reason an organism couldn't happen to have a receptor that coincidentally interacts with more than one type of molecule and so inappropriately react to one, or one that breaks and fails to react. Let's take sweetness. Many animals, humans included, find that common antifreeze used in cars tastes sweet, and so many of them will drink it if given the opportunity. This stuff is also extremely toxic and can kill many organisms in doses far smaller than what those animals typically drink. On the other hand, felines can't taste sweet at all, and simply fail to react to sweet things. That's why a dog will be very happy to eat some sugar. A cat simply doesn't see the point. But cats still have the basic sensory apparatus for tasting sweet things, such as a tongue with taste buds. All right, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to bring about a highly engineered with multiple parts working together for a purpose to talk about creatures engineered adaptability. Creatures engineered adaptability. So here, Randy is being fairly ambiguous. Does that mean that phenotypic plasticity can explain some adaptation to new environments seen in organisms? Because that's not controversial at all. But he might mean something far more significant. You see, ICR, like Ken Ham and basically all other creationists, realize that for the story of Noah's Ark to make any sense at all, without the Ark being bigger on the inside than the outside, that there needs to be a way to reduce the number of animals on the Ark to far fewer than two or seven of each extant species, depending on whether they're clean animals or not. To do this, creationists usually say that the kind referred to in Genesis is not a species, but rather it's a larger group of animals. They usually put this at about the Linnaean rank of family. Now this in itself is odd, as family is an arbitrary rank that doesn't mean anything. A family of beetles is a far different thing than a family of birds, which in turn is a far different thing than a family of mammals. And even within these groups, there's no way to say that the family Giraffidae and Cercopithecidae are of the same level. But nonetheless, creationists find it plausible to think that these arbitrarily extensive groupings of organisms that humans invented for their own convenience, and for no reason at all, rank the same, are actually a real part of nature. But for this to be true, that means that animals like the tiger and the snow leopard had to evolve from the ancestral cat and that animals like the African elephant and the woolly mammoth did too. But the problem here is that we have genomes for many such animals, and it's not just phenotypic plasticity. You could raise a tiger cub like a snow leopard cub. I promise you won't get a snow leopard at the end of that process. Similarly, I don't care how cold an enclosure you keep an African elephant calf in. It won't grow into a woolly mammoth, and we know that this is because the plasticity doesn't go far enough. Some of these differences, most in fact, are genetic. So if Randy is going to claim that his no natural selection regime of organisms actively adapting to the environment can explain that kind of difference between species, he's going to have to show how, when, and in which cells these adaptive mutations are induced. I don't think he can do that. I'm honestly not even sure he's going to try. I think he might just sort of weakly imply some kind of Lamarckian evolution and then just leave it at that. Now, we're all adaptable. Did you notice that when Dr. Clary was speaking, he was running out of gas. That's because he had COVID and he hasn't fully recovered yet. Well, let's hope he was no longer contagious. He had, he had a really bad case of COVID. I thought he was going to really be sick and almost be with the Lord. I got COVID and I haven't fully recovered yet either. So both of us kind of like when we used to be able to talk on one massive breath, we're kind of gasping for air a little bit because neither one of us have fully recovered. Honestly, that sucks. I'm not here to wish ill health on either of these guys. This is what creatures are doing. What? Getting sick? Yeah, everyone is aware of that. We're trying to recover. We have an engineered adaptability. ICR has put together a model, a model which describes how, how organisms adapt. They continuously track what? The environment. It's a descriptive term. It's not magical, like natural selection. 
I still feel like we have in no way been shown how differential reproductive success in the context of specific environments is magical. I also feel like this model will not be well described. Or artificial selection. By the way, when people use a real brain and really select, evolutionists call that artificial. Uh, they get everything 100% backwards, 100% backwards. I have no idea what his point is or how artificial selection is backwards, but I do note that he's not rejecting its effectiveness. But that also means that differential reproductive success, which is what drives both natural selection and artificial selection, does in fact work to modify populations of organisms over time. So what prevents this level of adaptation to the environment from affecting reproductive success? It must be something, or natural selection simply emerges from the system, just like science says it ought to. And I want to talk about one specific area because I want to bring something new that even if you're a creationist veteran for 50 years, and some of you are here, something that you haven't heard before. That would be nice since as far as I can tell, creationism has been moving at a snail's pace to the point that Jackson Wheat can read a book from the 1960s by creationists and despite being about 60 years old, it's basically all the same bad arguments as current creationist groups use. I want to talk about anticipatory systems. So systems which allow organisms to anticipate things in advance, or to put it in a very plain way, adapting today for tomorrow's challenges. Now this would be groundbreaking. If he could show a way that organisms can mutate to become adapted for new environments, both deterministically and before the conditions of those environments even occur, that would be hard to comprehend given current models of biology. That would require a radical departure from the current consensus, and frankly, I'd have a hard time coming up with anything but a higher power type thing that could be in charge of that. Although, there are a few other options, but most of them have similarly significant theological or spiritual implications. Now that is cool. That is really cool. Yeah, to put it very mildly, it is. But are we actually going to see his homework on this one? As a fact, that's so super cool, human engineers can't even really do it yet. There's a lot of cool things that human engineers can do, but they're not really good at this. So at one point, humans couldn't make heavier-than-air flying machines. That doesn't indicate that birds are or were magical. That humans cannot currently engineer a machine that does a particular thing does not say anything about the ability of evolution to result in a biological organism that can do that thing. Adapting when? Today for what? Tomorrow's challenges. Wow. That would really be cool, because this is answers what we ought to do, how we ought to do things. Now you see this young gal here, she's facing on a fork in the road. Should she go to the right or should she go to the left? You know what would help her make a decision? Is if she could see what? What's at the end of each path? But why are we spending time convinced that this is a cool ability? We all know that. There's a simple reason people get duped by psychics. It's because we all think that the ability to see the future or distant places or whatever is super cool. We're skipping any more of, gee, look how cool all organisms being psychic would be stuff. Because we get it. This is what anticipatory systems enable creatures to do. It's not, they don't get to see into the future, but they kind of anticipate what's coming up the road. They kind of like get to look over the hill. Oh, I get it. They don't see into the future, they see into the future, obviously. This makes total sense. So to speak, this is a really, really highly engineered and really cool mechanism. It sure would be, but I've yet to see any indication that it's a thing organisms can do. We went from organisms can sense their environment, which is true, to phenotypic plasticity, which is real, to organisms can use psychic powers to change their own genomes to adapt to environments before the environments even exist. I feel like we've skipped a few steps in getting to that last claim. Engineers tried to do this. In 2006, New Horizons, it's an interplanetary probe, was launched. Cape Kennedy. In 20, it, it, it circled multiple planets, circled around the Earth, picking up speed, circled other planets, picking up speed, and whoosh, was sent out towards the end of the solar system, and in 2015, rendezvoused with Pluto. How many miles away? Three billion miles. That's almost mind-boggling to imagine it. Okay, if you're playing Creationist Bingo, make sure you fill in the spot for big number. That's big numbers, people. We have big numbers. And it has to keep track of where it is, where Pluto is. The engineers at NASA kind of nudged it along the way. By nudged along, he means using rocket burns 
calculated by NASA scientists and engineers. There were five course corrections in getting to Pluto. New Horizons didn't calculate any of them. It doesn't have the capacity to do that. But still, is this an engineering marvel? <laughs> you hit Pluto three billion miles away many years into the future. That is anticipatory planning. I mean, I guess, but as far as I know, humans didn't have to alter their anatomy or genome to make it happen. They mostly use things like calculus and patched conic models, with some help from things like the rocket equation. New Horizons had no idea about any of this, and I'm still not seeing any reason to think that other animals can do similar things in order to change their genetic and physical makeup to pre-adapt to not yet present environmental conditions. And if that wasn't enough, it circled around Pluto, picked up some more speed, and flew out to 2019, another billion miles, and rendezvoused with a rock that was 22 miles across. Yep, following another set of similar course corrections. 22 miles across, 22 a billion. I mean, you're talking a fraction of a degree, and it rendezvoused with it. That is anticipatory planning. That is incredible type of planning. I don't want to diminish the amazing feats of engineering done by NASA or anything, but also, this second rendezvous was set up by another set of course corrections at various points. It's not like after leaving Pluto, it just so happened that Horizons was so well planned that it was on a direct intercept for its new target. You know what? Creatures can do the same thing. Here we have a, a little dragonfly. It wants to eat this moth. When it gets close enough, it doesn't just run down the moth and just by brute speed just overpower it. It makes a plan of where the moth is going to be. It plans out where it's going to be and boom, it goes on an anticipatory trajectory and intercepts the moth. This is true and it's one of the most amazing facts about dragonflies. Most flying predators do not eat this way. Most of them simply fly directly towards their prey, which if done fast enough will eventually mean that they are directly behind the prey and since they're faster than the prey, if they can stay on target, like a Y-Wing in the Battle of Yavin. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. Loosen up! They'll eventually catch up and be able to snap up their food. Dragonflies, on the other hand, take into account the current velocity of their prey, as well as their capacities, and predict where to fly to most efficiently connect with their victim. This is similar to a human hunter targeting prey and leading them with his hunting rifle because if he aims directly at the target, he will miss. But if he gives a lead, then the bullet and the prey will be in the same place at the same time, much to the detriment of the prey. Of course, since this is not what most aerial predators do, it raises the question of why not? And how is it a good example of organisms sensing future environmental conditions, since an insect flying is not a good indicator of future climactic shifts or such things? The same way that that interplanetary probe intercepted Pluto, and it's using the same mechanisms. I don't think that dragonflies are using radios to communicate with teams of scientists and engineers at NASA to get them to do calculations so that they can intercept their prey. Sorry, Randy. And this is what the paper shows. It actually doesn't show the mechanisms by which arthropods seem to be able to consider the future consequences of their actions, just that they can. It's actually a really cool and fairly short paper, and it's more of a survey of some literature than a reporting on a new experiment. My favorite experiment that the paper talks about is using a ladder with randomly spaced rungs, some of which would be removed also randomly as a grasshopper climbed the ladder. The grasshopper would climb the ladder only occasionally glancing back to check on its foot placement, which already means that the grasshopper must have a sense of its own positioning as well as a map of the environment and ability to map one onto the other. But impressively, when a rung was removed, the grasshopper would initially grab for the now missing rung, but then not finding it there, it would automatically and without always needing to look, reach that leg for the next rung. All of this means that even though we perhaps were taught in school that arthropods have no thoughts and we're basically just robots with a large number of pre-programmed behaviors, this may not be the case. They seem to be able to learn, to some degree, to hold internal mental models of both themselves and their environment. What the paper doesn't indicate is that insects can somehow change their physiology or morphology in anticipation of future environmental conditions. Of course, the paper is linked in the description. By the way, I have put all these papers in all of them. For those who are real purists, I want you to know what the scientific paper is that I got everything from in this particular case. I appreciate it. Quite a lot, actually. And this paper says this. Evidence of internal models in dragonfly behavior suggests use of a predictive model of the prey's trajectory and a copy of the dragonfly's own motor commands. This dragonfly with its tiny little dragonfly brain is making a predictive model. 
inside of it. Something that human engineers are struggling to do. Again, that human engineers struggle to make things does not indicate that they cannot come about from natural causes. These are not just reactive, these are proactive models. In some cases, like the dragonflies or the spiders of genus Portia, yes. In other cases from the paper, such as honeybees, ants, and grasshoppers, this is less clear. Which flow from a logic-based system. Logic-based systems, and when they're in creatures, they give creatures foresight of what they ought to do and how they ought to self-adjust to predicted external conditions which are coming. Right, like which way to fly to catch another flying insect. But remember, Randy is trying to argue that this ability somehow allows them to predict things like average temperature and rainfall in the coming centuries, and then somehow change their genetics to reflect these future conditions. And they may be coming the next day, they may be coming a month, they may be coming a year from now. We're going to need a f citation on that one, Galuzo. That paper in no way even hinted at the ability of any animal to predict conditions any more than a few minutes in the future. Pray tell, what stimulus is a dragonfly going to receive that will give it reliable information about conditions in a day, let alone a year? But they are giving these abilities to, like, forecast what's going to be happening and adjust today for those kinds of things. In other words, when creatures self-adjust and when they adapt, it is not just reactive, but it is incredibly proactive. Okay. It's time to talk about adaptation in nature and in the lab and why this is nonsense in some depth. Essentially, we're going to come up with predictions based on Dr. Galuz's ideas and see if any experiments have already addressed this. This is how science works. If Randy wants to be taken seriously as a scientist, this is what he should be doing. So we know that in a fairly short time, organisms can adapt to new environments, both in the lab and in nature. For example, flies in both nature and the lab can change significantly due only to a change in diet in a matter of months or years. Birds will change beak shape in response to climate and shifting availability of food. Bacteria will gain resistance to toxins or new metabolic pathways. Now some amount of this is in fact due to phenotypic plasticity, such as that which Dr. Galuza has already mentioned, but not all of it. And how do we know? Well, because we can check. In fact, that's largely what the whole Lenski long-term E. coli experiment is about. They keep records of the genetics of different populations of bacteria in a unique environment and have been looking at the different ways in which different populations have evolved. And it hasn't just been phenotypic plasticity. Their genetics are now significantly different from the wild type E. coli. So let's see how a few different interpretations of the idea that organisms can forecast their environment might affect the experiment if the idea were true. Well first, perhaps the bacteria could somehow foretell that they were about to go into a liquid citrate and glucose medium in which they'd be shaken each day. We might expect that they'd probably pre-adapt themselves to this by doing things like getting rid of their metabolically costly flagella, as is often seen in lineages in the experiment. We would also expect that they'd do some of the other things that have changed in the experiment right from the outset, like becoming hypermutators, or even gaining the ability to aerobically metabolize citrate, as happened in one group in the experiment. But this isn't what happened. The first few generations were essentially identical to the wild type, and we know because it's documented. It took years to develop all the currently existing strains with their various adaptations. We would also expect the fitness to only really increase at the beginning of the experiment and then more or less halt as the organisms have changed themselves to adapt to the environment they foresaw and which they presumably know would persist for what to them is the equivalent of millennia for humans. Instead, it has risen throughout the experiment, although it is doing so at a declining rate as the bacteria approach their local fitness maxima through time. Another option is that all of the change would have simply been down to phenotypic plasticity and that there would be no new genetic traits. And we see the fitness increase right at the start and stay high and then not really change. Of course, we know that genetic changes did indeed happen and fitness rose over time, so this doesn't work. Last, perhaps the mutations are induced, but slowly and in anticipation of the new environment, and then even further while the bacteria persist in the environment. This would get us the fitness increase that we actually see in the experiment, but there is another problem. If these mutations are deterministic and in response to the environment, we would expect them to be essentially the same in all strains, since all the strains started as clones and are all in the same conditions. This is not the case here in real life. Well, perhaps adapting to a weird environment like a citrate glucose flask isn't a great test. Well then, let's travel back some 80 years or so to look at the Luria Delbruck experiment. This experiment was specifically designed to see whether mutations were the result of organisms responding to environmental changes, as Randy would have it, or if they were simply random. The experiment used antibiotic resistance. 
if mutations are the result of environmental stimuli, we would expect that different groups of bacteria of the same species would all develop resistance to the same antibiotic in the same concentrations at the same rate. After all, they are all nearly identical and exposed to the same environmental conditions, and before they are, there's not a particular reason to expect them to have mutations granting resistance if, as Randy would have it, such things are actually deterministic responses to the environment. So we should expect all the colonies to behave about the same with increasing amounts of antibiotic. Turns out, this is not what happened. Some colonies were nearly immune from the onset, others only gained resistance as the experiment progressed, and some never actually developed resistance. This means that mutations granting resistance arose before the experiment in some bacteria, during it in others, and never in yet others. This tells us that these types of mutations happen essentially at random, and are not tied to an environment in which they might be useful. Some fennec fox is just as likely to have a mutation that would make it well adapted to a humid forest as it is to have a mutation that makes it better suited to its desert environment. But that's just how it is, and if that fox were lucky enough to end up somehow in such a forest against all odds, then hooray for it. It will be selected for over its kin that lacks such a mutation. But none of them will get the mutation in advance because they know they're off to a humid forest. And similarly, after getting there, their offspring will be no more likely to get mutations benefiting them in that environment than they would have been while still in the desert. In other words, we know for a fact that adaptations arise from changes in genetics, and that such changes happen as a result of mutation, and that such mutations are not predetermined or caused by the environment. Rather, they are stochastic. Who is going to build something into his creatures to continuously attract environments to not just always be reacting, but to be proactive in advance so that they can adjust as necessary not in terms of multi-generational timescales, and demonstrated quite well by multiple experiments. So I wanna go through very quickly because we have three parts to this talk. I wanna show you some examples of how they do it. I wanna discuss how it works. I wanna give you some predictions of what I expect to find when we finally reverse engineer the biology and figure out how what's happening on all of this. This is, this is totally new. Nobody's doing this. It is really old, and the reason that no one is doing it is sort of the same reason no one is really investigating how to build an ornithopter. We tried. We tried really hard for years. It just doesn't seem to be working. Nobody's doing this in the creationists. Nobody's even doing this amongst the secularists. But I want to give you some examples. So obviously, we want to start with all kinds of creatures, plants, and this is one for tomato plants. And they were exposing tomato plants to um, a creature, I think it was a slug in this case, that would eat the tomato plants. And this is what they found in these papers. New research now shows that some flora can detect an herbivorous animal. What's herbivorous? One that eats a plant. Well before it launches an assault, letting a plant mount a preemptive defense that even works against other pests. Wow. Of course, this study is linked in the description, and of course, while it's cool, it doesn't actually do anything to indicate that tomatoes have a way to adapt their genetics to future environments. Instead, it's an example of tomato plants picking up on incidental chemical signals from herbivores in their environment to make themselves less palatable as food at the cost of slower growth. Which, sure, is an example of a cool mechanism for phenotypic plasticity, but we need far more than this for continuous environmental tracking to be a real thing. The plant isn't even attacked, but it says, I think I'm going to get attacked, and so it starts to make its defenses. Hey, remember back when Randy said that he wanted to get rid of all anthropomorphism in science and how it was never okay? Well, guess what? Saying that the damn tomato plant says anything is anthropomorphizing the tomato. So I guess it's okay to anthropomorphize as long as you're clear that you don't actually think tomatoes or presumably nature itself are actual persons. And in this experiment, as they start out, none of the plants were actually ever attacked. Oh, so he just didn't read the text of the paper. They were attacked by caterpillars, granted, in a highly unusual way, but it still occurred. Just go read the paper yourself. The lead investigator said, we just gave them cues that suggested an attack was coming. What was the cue? Slug slime. Slug slime. They could detect the slug slime. That's better than looking at the mouse, at the monkey butts that Dr. Thomas was talking about here. Slug slime. We gave them cues that suggested an attack was coming, and that was enough to trigger big changes in their chemistry. Wow, not just big changes in their chemistry, but optimized changes in their chemistry. 
yep, plants are real cool. Now I wonder, how will snail mucus let a tomato know what will be happening in a year or so so it can induce mutations? It says that when they exposed them to this, they were able to generate a defensive response in plants that have not been attacked. And plants integrate the many sources of information regarding attack in their environment to optimize investment in their defenses. Okay, I'm skipping any more examples of an organism being able to sense present conditions, which allows it to respond to the immediate future in a way that does not actually do anything to explain genetic differences as a result of adaptation to the changing environments. Since I haven't seen all of this yet, uh, that might mean I'm done here. Do animals have emotions? Well, humans are animals and they have emotions, but also I think it's silly to say that other animals don't have emotions, especially those similar to humans and who display what look like emotions. Oh, you better believe they do. They're very conscious. Very, very conscious in that. And she loves her little cub right there. Hey, I agree. How does it happen? Well, here's a cool paper that was on error management dealing with these trans transgenerational effects. And they said this. Oh, hey, look, more phenotypic plasticity. So no change in genetics. Oh, well, it's in the description. And now we skip again. You are an individual. You're even an individual compared to your parents. Your parents are your parents, you are you. You are a distinct, autonomous individual, even though you've got your arm on your lovely wife. You're two separate beings. Mom, when that baby is developing in you, it is a separate human being. Is this about to become about abortion? I really hope not. But yes, in utero, a fetus is still a member of its species, and its mother is not the same member of the species. This isn't exactly controversial. It's a separate human being. Mom, you cannot change the baby as it's developing. Really? Let me introduce you to fetal alcohol syndrome, which is caused by excessive alcohol exposure in the womb. It can cause small eyes, a thin upper lip, upturned nose, deformities of the limbs, slow growth and short stature, vision and hearing problems, small head and brain size, and heart, kidney, and bone disease. That's a change people make to their babies. Ever know someone taking, or have you taken yourself, prenatal vitamins? Those are there to change your baby from being malnourished to being well-nourished. There's another change people make to their babies. Both occur during pregnancy. You absolutely can change your baby, intentionally or unintentionally, at least phenotypically. What you can't do is change it genetically, at least not yet. But the thing is, changing it genetically is precisely what Randy needs. You cannot get in there and directly change it. Baby starts from a single cell organism, a single cell, and baby self-constructs. Baby self-constructs. What mom can do, mom can act as a sensor of the environment. Mom can send information in, but mom cannot directly change baby's DNA which is a problem for Galuz's ideas. He needs Mom to be able to do this for his ideas to work. Let's see if he notices that himself. Okay, so the evidence that babies can change their own genome is that there was a paper that said that they didn't. No, Randy, that doesn't make a lick of f sense. Phenotypic plasticity explicitly refers to the ability of organisms to use the same genotype to produce varying phenotypes. You can't jump from that to therefore organisms can change their genotype intentionally to get the phenotype they need. Mom can send information in, and then baby, as a separate organism, can detect mom's information, bring it into itself, and adjust itself. Does that make sense? Okay, so at least now we have a model for how continuous environmental tracking is supposed to work, at least in placental mammals. Not sure how we're supposed to apply that to everyone else, but now it's time for Randy to produce a shred of evidence that placental mammal embryos mutate their own genome in response to stimuli from their mothers about the environment she's encountering. And remember, it'll have to be something other than phenotypic plasticity because that's exactly what doesn't matter at this point. In other words, there's no magic where mom reaches in and changes it. There has to be an engineered system. Mom sends data, baby must have a what? A sensor for mom's data, a sensor for mom's data, and then baby adjusts itself. That is how you get two separate entities to work together. I know because that's how engineers build them. So this is what we're going to discuss in these changes. 
It goes on to say this, however, maternal stress can play adaptive roles across a wide varieties of animal taxa if stress-induced phenotypes better prepare offspring for a stressful postnatal environment. In what kinds of animals? Mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish. All right, so let's say it can happen across the much shorter time in which maternal chemistry can affect the embryo. I guess the model is now proposed to encompass all vertebrates, more or less, despite the fact that the paper in question says that such induced mutations did not happen. Does that seem like it's pretty comprehensive? Yeah, yeah it's pretty comprehensive that, that parents can do this. Well, here's an, uh, here's an interesting one. We'll start out with <clears throat> a pretty basic creature, very highly complicated, a sea urchin. Great, another article to link in the description. Let's see if it actually involved genetic changes to the sea urchins. And these researchers are worried about global warming. In fact, a, a, a lot of really good research comes out of the fact that people, many scientists, are scared to death of global warming. So they want to know what's going to happen to creatures if the environment changes. And in this particular case, they're wondering if the ocean pH changes, if the ocean temperature changes, if those changes in the ocean become stressful, what are creatures like sea urchins going to do? And it says that they're going to change their gene expression, but not their genome in the short run. You know, exactly the opposite of what Dr. Galuza needs. Again, check the description. You know, traditionally, the way you use a paper as a source is you find a paper that actually supports your position, not one that either contradicts it or fails to support it. Here's another one on little nematode, a tiny little word called worm called C. elegans. And in this particular case, they starved mom. Well, at least we're out of deuterostomia, but again, it's just phenotypic plasticity, not induced mutations. So let's try again. P.S. Study in the description. Here's another one. Oh, hey, a study that didn't even look at the genetics of the animals in question. Guess this one is a bust too, but it's still in the description if you want to read it. Next. How about humans? I'm very confident that humans have phenotypic plasticity, some of which is determined in utero. So, like the other six examples we've seen, I'm sure nothing here is about to help Galuza in any way. Any, any effect on humans, cross-generational effect? Well, yes, there's a, multiple studies on this. On cross, How many like that picture? Isn't that a great picture? That's, a, that's another one. Moms love their kids too, in that case. Was maternal affection in humans in some serious doubt? This one was a study done in Norway. Oh, hey, look, our seventh paper finding absolutely no evidence for induced mutation as a result of prenatal conditioning. Yay! It's in the description, as you know. There was another one that was done on men in the Philippines, and they were also checking on birth weight and size and testosterone production as they got older and aggressiveness. And they also checked whether they attracted more females or less females. It was a really a great study on all of this, on that, and, and uh, they found that... And uh, I guess it's not going to be cited. So the source for this is, trust me, bro, from Dr. Galuza. Well, given his track record, I don't trust him. Unfortunately, in China, about 1959 to 1964, they had one of their five-year plans in China where they were going to change the effects of agriculture. Unfortunately, like many of their five-year plans, it didn't boost agricultural production, it had it plummet. Yep, historically, centrally planned agriculture is about as bad as just not having agriculture. It's a recipe for disaster. And between 1959 and 1964, about 40 million Chinese people starved to death. 40 million. Yes, there's a reason I'm not a fan of the Chinese Communist Party, and this is part of it. This explains when I was a kid, and I was growing up in the 60s, my mom always said to me, eat everything on your plate, there's starving children in China. My mom used to say something similar, and she was not amused when one day I asked if I could send the starving children the food I didn't want. And I'm like, this meant nothing to me. Now I'm 60 years old, it's like, oh, now I know what my mom was saying. There's starving children in China, eat everything on your plate, and there. It's still a silly thing to say, even knowing that he knows that she wasn't lying about the starving children. What happened? Well, this, was, this provided a natural laboratory because they were able to follow the children of parents who obviously didn't starve to death, but were in severe starvation conditions in cities 
versus the children of parents who migrated to the city who were not starved. Awesome, so let's see a paper that shows the consistent deterministic mutations induced by this common prenatal environment. And they were able to follow the effects of children whose parents, mom was starved, or dad was starved, or mom and dad were starved, what the effects on, of that were to them versus children whose parents were, weren't starved in the same city as time went on. And guess what they found? Well, given that we're currently 0 for 7 on showing actually induced mutations, and rather all we've seen is phenotypic plasticity, I'm going to say that we're in for an eighth instance of phenotypic plasticity where there is not a whiff of induced deterministic mutation as required for Galuz's ideas to work. Let's see, shall we? This was, oh, uh, we'll, we'll skip on this uh, right there. They found that prenatal exposure to famine, prenatal exposures to famine, that means that your parents were being starved while you were in your mother's womb, prenatal exposure, the odds of developing hyperglycemia were about two to one in both children and grandchildren, and the probability of developing type two diabetes in the children of starved parents was 75% higher compared to those offspring whose parents were not starved. Ah, yet again, this is all epigenetics and phenotypic plasticity when you check the paper. And in this case, it was actually maladaptive, not adaptive. So we're giving Randy two L's, not one. Looks like he's 0 for 9. I'm sure the next one will be the one. Why do you think that could be? So let's start connecting our dots. If the children are born to starved parents, they probably have what? The thrifty phenotype, which means they become calorie hoarders. Yeah, diabetes isn't going to help you with hoarding calories. You'll just die if untreated. Sorry, Randy, but we're moving on they tend to hoard their calories. And so, that because they're anticipating being born in a starvation environment. But they did not grow up in a starvation environment. They did not grow up in a calorie deficient environment. They grew up in an abundant calorie abundant environment. Therefore, their phenotype to store and hoard calories led to them developing hyperglycemia and diabetes faster. You know, that's not the worst argument here. But also, Randy said that organisms can look ahead years into the future. So why do their parents not realize that starvation conditions wouldn't persist? I guess maybe organisms can't stunt the future beyond their immediate environment. But I'll be nice and say that because I actually like the point about maladaptation being because they were adapted for a different environment, we'll set the loss counter back to 0 for 8. Now, Randy can't ever say I didn't do anything for him. Well, how in the world does all of this happen? How are we going to explain these things? What are the mechanisms for it? The mechanisms for what? Epigenetics? Well, basically, certain environmental conditions can cause things like changes to the physical structure, but not the sequence of the genome, making it so that certain less needed or unneeded genes are less likely to be expressed, changing the biochemistry and therefore the phenotype of the organism. For example, if a particular enzyme is not needed, that area of DNA may become methylated, which will cause it to curl up on itself, making it much harder to transcribe, such that the particular enzyme is no longer expressed in the organism, even though the genotype still contains the ability to do so. Epigenetics is a pretty big field, but it's not like we don't know anything about how it works. We also know that it can't explain the changes in the genotypes that we see in the wild and in the lab when organisms adapt to evolve to new environments over many generations. Well, evolutionists have their mechanisms to try to explain things that are happening all around them. In fact, their perceptions really had to change because initially they thought that the small brains of insects and other invertebrates are often thought to constrain these animals entirely in the moment. Okay, so now are we changing the mechanism from prenatal chemical signaling inducing mutations in offspring to conscious thought inducing mutations in adult or juveniles long after maternal signaling has ceased? because that's a very different model. Arthropods being smarter than we thought doesn't really tell us anything about their capacity to induce mutations in response to environmental stimuli, which again, we know bacteria definitely do not do. So I'm not sure why we're just assuming that crabs or butterflies can, but even more so, this doesn't help with organisms like the aforementioned tomato, which has no ability to think whatsoever. In other words, their tiny brain only lets them live what? Right for the instant, but that's not true actually found that even with insects, 
that they have foresight. We propose a basic form of foresight. The ability to predict the outcome of one's own actions is at the heart of such behavioral flexibility. Is Randy just picking out the word foresight and then assuming the paper in question supports him just because it has a thematic similarity in one aspect of his ill-defined continuous environmental tracking? Sure seems that way. Well, their substitute God, the natural selector, selector he's going to act like God, but he's not going to do it as a real engineer would do because that would sound a lot too much like design. So your good bud here that all of you recognize, Richard Dawkins, says... He's not a bud of mine. In fact, I have a lot of criticisms. That natural selection, notice what he says about natural selection. The blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered, he didn't discover, he invented. Gonna need to see a citation for that one, Randy, because so far it does look like he discovered it, and nothing has been shown so far that would contradict that. In which we now know is the explanation for the existence of apparently purposeful forms of all life. Oh! What did natural selection do? Caused those organisms with genotypes that enabled better reproductive success in a particular environment to cause those genotypes and the associated phenotypes to predominate in the populations, allowing organisms to radiate into new niches and become better and better at their current niches as time wore on. It brought about the apparently purposeful forms of all life. It created everything, but it has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. So I remember that time that Randy was telling us how scientists were attributing personal characteristics to nature inappropriately. I guess he was lying, because now we can see he knows that that's not what's happening. It's always nice when creationists just come out and catch themselves in a lie. Francis Crick, co-discoverer DNA, said, I suspect that some people also dislike the idea that natural selection has no foresight. The process itself, in effect, does not know where to go. It is the environment that provides the direction. And the over the long run, its effects are largely unpredictable in detail. Yeah, I can understand people not liking that. But hey, science isn't here to make you like it. It's here to give us the best description of the physical world it is possible to give with the available evidence. Then the world's leading researchers on lizards, Jonathan Loso, says, you must remember that natural selection has no foresight. It will not favor a mutation because it will be useful in the future. So what they're trying to say is... Exactly like we saw in the Luria Delbruck experiment. Mutations happen independent of environment and can then be selected for or against as they arise. And remember, the counter to this was eight papers none of which included any indication of induced deterministic mutations as a result of environmental pressures. This substitute God doesn't act like a real engineer. It uses random broken things like mutation, and it doesn't even have a plan. It has no foresight. It's also not a substitute God. Just ask the majority of religious people of all religions who don't think that the reality of evolution has replaced their religious belief. It just ambles along and cobbles creatures together. In other words, they want to push back against any idea that anybody would have that when you look at creatures, they were really engineered and designed. I wouldn't care to push back against it if, you know, there were some evidence. Instead, it's usually just lies. You know, like misrepresenting eight papers in a row about phenotypic plasticity as having some relevance to induced mutations. Or a paper about arthropod intelligence as being about the ability of arthropods to induce heritable mutations in themselves in response to things about how to traverse a complicated 3D environment or predict the flight path of prey, when in fact the paper doesn't talk about any such thing. Because they want to use all the anti-design language that they could possibly muster. Random. No foresight, no plan, no purpose, nothing. It's not that these scientists are against design, it's that there's no need to include that hypothesis. It's not parsimonious, and non-design ideas already fit the data perfectly well. All of that is so they can condition those college students, which Dr. Thomas was talking to the other night, so they say no plan, no purpose, no engineering, no design. This is what you need to see. Darwin was not there to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Funny then how he spent literally the entirety of his most famous book trying to do just that. Darwin was there to explain the design of life on Earth, which was the eminent testimony to God. Well, he definitely didn't try to do that, so I don't know, man. Maybe Randy should actually read Origin of Species. 
and he wanted a substitute agent to do it. Nope. In fact, it wasn't even his observations that finally led to his loss of faith. It was the death of his daughter. And he was reluctant about his findings, especially because he thought it would be troublesome for his wife's faith. Because by all indications, Charles Darwin was a loving family man who cared deeply about his wife and children. But even if he had, that's just a genetic fallacy. Evolution is wrong because the person most famous for discovering it was a meanie. That's not a real argument. And that's why all of this language about no purpose, no plan, no foresight, random, mutation, broken, blah, 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 chokes evolutionary literature. I gotta say, the guy who complained about science anthropomorphizing nature is now anthropomorphizing language about how we shouldn't anthropomorphize nature written by scientists. That's like double irony. That's why. It's to push back against any notion of a creator. Tell it to Theodosius Dobzhansky, who said, Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and who was also an Eastern Orthodox Christian who believed in a creator. Anyway, what these guys would have you believe is this, this totally blind process, which is somehow driven by death. Differential reproductive success, not death. Where one animal builds itself on the backs of the death and the extinction of so many others, this death-driven worldview with no purpose, no desire, no consciousness, no foresight, somehow crafted creatures by the jillions that show overwhelming purpose, overwhelming desires. They have consciousness, they have foresight, and they have anticipation. Fun fact, personal incredulity isn't an argument. Does that make any sense? Yes. No sense. Look, if he's not going to make an argument, why should I? In fact, it's incoherent. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to need a source on that one there. So, we need to do biology as if Darwin had never been born. I'm down with that, but the thing is, we already do. Darwin isn't a prophet. His ideas aren't sacred or believed because he proposed them. In fact, a number of his ideas have been completely rejected because they are contrary to the evidence that has since been gathered. That's not my statement. That's Paul Nelson's, but I love it. So if we're going to do biology as if Darwin had never been born, what we need to do is replace back into biology what Darwin took out. Only if you can find evidence for it. So far, none has even been hinted at. The thing is that while we remember great scientists for amazing new discoveries, that's only after the evidence has shown them to be right. We don't teach relativity in school because Einstein was so cool. It's taught because it corresponds to reality and can make successful predictions about future data. This is also true about evolution. If both Einstein and Darwin were erased from all human memory, there would be no reason for either biology or physics to change. In other words, Darwin went from looking at, uh, before Darwin, looking at what creatures could do, looking at their internal innate capabilities, to what he said is, let's look at the environment of how the environment is shaping and molding creatures. Those aren't mutually exclusive things. We need to go back as if Darwin is not there and start looking back again into the internal capabilities of organisms. And this dude cited nine papers literally doing that. People are already on it. It just doesn't support his claims. You can't just assume that you're right and then go about explaining biology that way. You have to show that your ideas are robust and well-supported before you can use them as the basis for further research. The thing is that evolution and natural selection, as a part of it, have done that to the satisfaction of the scientific community. That's why they're science. And then begin to explain it as it really is, as an engineered system. Actually, it's an engineered system made up of many, many, many systems. This is what we can do. And when we bring this engineered adaptability approach back into biology, we will rid biology of all of the magical language. Yeah, we're going to get rid of the magical language of, you know, ordinary physical processes and replace it with a totally not magical language of actual magic. Makes perfect sense. Which chokes evolutionary literature. Again with the personification, huh? We will bring some clarity of thought will bring some cohesiveness and explanation, which is totally lacking. So how would we do that? Well, this car right here is adaptable. It has sensors, speed sensors. It has a computer. And it doesn't reproduce with either 
induced predetermined mutations or random ones. So who cares? Moving on. We need to go back right from the very beginning and change our thinking about why adaptation happens. The dominant creationist teaching, which, is, which has been about for many years, is that adaptation is a response to the fall. After the fall, creatures needed to adapt. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Interesting. So I guess things before the fall weren't perfect and organisms could suffer ill effects, presumably up to and including death, from changing environments in the prelapsarian world. Right from the very beginning, the Bible says there were conditions that were dynamic. The Bible says right from the beginning that there were day and night cycles. Does that make the earth a dynamic place? Over the course of an individual organism's life, yes. Over the course of a population's multi-generational time on earth, no. Intergenerational adaptation doesn't happen on a time scale of days or even years in most cases. We're talking like decades at the minimum for most organisms. If the day night cycle and seasons are the same over that kind of time frame, then they count as constant as far as multi-generational adapting populations are concerned. The Bible says that there were going to be seasons and we're going to mark those seasons by the stars. Do seasons make the earth a dynamic place? Again, not on any relevant time scale. The Bible said be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. When one creature goes in and fills a niche where other creatures are, does that make it dynamic for those creatures? In this case, yes. But also that dynamism is going to lead to differential reproductive success if there is genetic variability in the organisms, which means we're going to have natural selection. So if I came in and I filled your niche, I would change your niche. For the better, of course. That's literally impossible. If two organisms are occupying the same niche in the real world, and either they will partition the niche or one of them will be driven to extinction, at least locally. But I would change your niche. I would change your niche on all of that. But the Bible also says, so the Bible says that the, the earth was dynamic, but the Bible also says creatures reproduce after their kind. Hey, it's our best friend, the never defined kind, which comes from the Hebrew word mean, mim yo nun, which means kind, sex, gender, or genus. You know, the same things covered by the English word used to translate it. It's a vague grouping of things that are similar enough to be considered a group for current discussion. So what mean of animal is that? Oh, it's a mammal. Okay, what mean of mammal? Well, it's a horse. What mean of horse? It's a Clydesdale foal. See how it's stupid to take the word as some kind of technical term? And further, of course animals reproduce after their mean. That's kind of the whole point of selection. If organisms didn't pass on their genetics in a way that resulted in similar offspring, then selection couldn't work because the advantageous genotype in a parent would have no correlation to the phenotype of the offspring. If I'm going to look at this from an engineering perspective, I'm going to see evidences of something that engineers would call robustness. Guess what? Robustness is taken into account in evolutionary biology. In other words, these organisms, even though they're facing dynamic environments, are going to maintain certain basic elements. They can take a licking and keep on ticking. They're robust, but they're also going to have some plastic elements, which means that they can flex they can change with some of these environmental changes. In fact, that phenotypic plasticity is part of robustness in the broad sense, but there's also robustness in terms of being able to mutate extensively without that necessarily causing problems. Here's Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, a professor of evolutionary biology at Rutgers University and the owner of the YouTube channel Creation Myths to tell us a bit more about robustness and phenotypic plasticity. His channel is linked in the description. Hello everybody, I'm going to give you two examples of traits that we see in organisms that are actually phenotypes that can evolve through natural selection and other evolutionary mechanisms, even though at first it doesn't seem like that's the case. The first is called phenotypic plasticity, or sometimes just plasticity. This is when you can get a range of phenotypes, which is to say physical traits, from the exact same genotype based on environmental conditions. Plants are a great illustration of plasticity. In many cases, if you take two genetically identical plants, put one in an environment with plenty of sunlight and the other in a shady environment, they'll end up looking very different. In the sunny environment, the leaves will tend to be smaller, while the plant in the shade will have much larger leaves to soak up as much sunlight as possible. Again, this is in genetically identical plants, clones, so this difference can't be explained by differences in the alleles between the two plants. 
This might sound like individuals are responding in a conscious way to their environment, but plasticity is actually a phenotype that has a genetic component. That means it's heritable and can evolve via natural and artificial selection, as we'll see. This has been demonstrated experimentally uh, with body size in fruit flies. Body size exhibits plasticity according to temperature, and flies have been selected for higher and lower levels of plasticity, showing how rather than being kind of a conscious response to the environment, the ability to exhibit plasticity is itself an evolvable trait. That's from a 2002 paper called Selection Experiments and the Study of Phenotypic Plasticity by S. M. Shiner. The second trait I want to discuss is called robustness, or sometimes you'll hear the phrase mutational robustness. Robustness is the concept that a genome is resistant to harmful effects of mutations. If a genome is highly susceptible to damaging mutations, it has low robustness. But if it can tolerate many mutations without a significant effect on fitness, it's considered robust against mutations. Like plasticity, robustness is a phenotype that can evolve. We can see this most strikingly in fast mutating viruses with small, dense genomes. This means that most of their genome is going to be actual genes, and most nucleotides are going to be constrained, meaning they're under selection against changes that occur via mutation. This is in contrast to, for example, the human genome, of which less than 2% codes for proteins and is mostly unconstrained. In other words, these small viral genomes subject to rapid mutations are inherently less robust than something like the human genome, meaning there is a much greater chance of mutations having a negative effect on fitness. But we can document such viruses evolving to maximize their robustness. To understand how this happens, I want to introduce the concept of a fitness landscape. This is a two or three or more dimensional representation of the fitness of specific genotypes in a specific environment. So just picture this as a two-dimensional graph. High fitness genotypes represented as peaks, while low fitness genotypes as valleys. I'm simplifying here, but think of a graph with genotype on the x-axis and fitness on the vertical y-axis. Any given genotype along that x-axis will correspond to some fitness value, and again, this is for a specific population in a specific environment. Now, some peaks in a fitness environment are going to be very high but very steep, meaning the fitness of that genotype is very high for that environment, but any deviation from it, even by one or two mutations, carries a significant cost. You could visualize this as the genotype, the individual, instead of being at the top of the peak, with just one or two mutations falling down the steep sides of that peak. Other peaks in that same landscape can be lower and broader, where the maximum achievable fitness for that peak is lower, but deviation from that maximum carries little, if any, cost. These wider, flatter peaks are more robust than tall, narrow peaks, even if the maximum is lower because individuals with that genotype can have offspring carrying one or more mutations without having a significant negative effect. So let's go back to our fast mutating viruses. In such populations, viruses can achieve the absolute highest peak, but because they mutate so rapidly, it's impossible to maintain. And because such peaks are often tall but very narrow, with any deviation from that optimum, even very similar genotypes, the mutated offspring of those most fit viruses are actually pretty mediocre. Compare that to the genotypes around a lower but flatter peak. They're also going to be constantly mutating away from the maximum, but the genotypes that differ by mutation or two are almost as good. That means you don't see the big drop-off in fitness as mutations occur, and you end up with a population of viruses with similar genotypes all clustered around that peak, with most individuals not actually having the best genotype but still being pretty close in terms of their fitness. When a population of fast mutating viruses has subgroups in both situations, a tall narrow peak and a wide flat peak, the latter tends to win, even though in absolute terms, the maximum fitness is lower. But that wider peak is more robust, so the average fitness tends to be higher. You've probably heard the term survival of the fittest. The term for the dynamics I've just described is survival of the flattest and it's how robustness is selected for in populations of fast mutating viruses. Thanks, Dan. All within limits. 
definite design parameters are going to affect them. Yes, plasticity is limited by the genome of the organism. That's why when we see adaptation that goes past the plasticity of the genome, it involves changes to that genome, which shifts the window of available phenotypes in the population. And that is something that's observed as we've gone over in both nature and in the lab. It's also a thing which Galusa has spectacularly failed to account for. So they must be robust and they must be plastic, which from an engineering perspective, we would call resilient. These are highly resilient creatures and these are design characteristics. They sure can be, but because they are subject to change with changes in the genome of the organisms in question, and because mutations do occur, and because they can affect reproductive success across generations, they're subject to that bogeyman of ICR, natural selection. And so to show that this isn't just subject to natural forces, Galusa is going to have to do a whole heck of a lot more than just saying that they're also a thing that designers make. That designers make a thing, does not mean that nature can't make a similar thing. So when the Lord made these creatures, he made them robust, he made them plastic, he made them resilient, right from the very beginning of creation in order to live on a highly dynamic earth. That wasn't very dynamic on the relevant time scales. Why? Why? Because highly dynamic things are glorious. That seems like a highly subjective take. Highly dynamic things express incredible engineering prowess. Highly dynamic things show the genius of the person who made it. So do incredibly stable things. No one is impressed by the Great Pyramid in Egypt because of how dynamic it is. Quite the opposite. After this is a bunch of theology about how God would totally be cool if he did X and not Y. I don't care. So. What creatures seem to do is they, be able, they seem to be able to anticipate and predict these environmental changes. Unless they're Chinese people, I guess. Because they didn't manage to predict the end of the famine in a way that altered their children's bodies to be better at surviving with more than starvation levels of food. Which leads to not random, but highly purposeful adaptations. Then experiments like the Lenski long-term E. coli experiment and the luria delbruck experiment would have had very different results. How they do it is by many, many, many innate systems which enable them to self-adjust. And all of which are evolvable. If you want to overthrow evolution, you need to do two things. One is make points that contradict evolution. The other is, you know, back up those claims. Randy struggles with the first and has utterly failed at the second. And why do they do it? Why do they continually track environments? So they can maintain their homeostasis. That's a word that goes back to eighth grade biology. Randy's basically right about that. That is why organisms have evolved the ability to adapt in a single lifetime to varying environments. It's also one of the more remarkable things about life on Earth. So, if creatures are really engineered, then engineering not only can be informed by biology, but engineering can inform biology. Therefore, I'm looking for corresponding system elements between a human engineered thing, some workmanship here that is doing a function, and creatures which are doing similar functions. And that would indeed be a prerequisite for demonstrating that creatures are designed. But while it's necessary, it's not sufficient to show that. Also, let's take a look at that New Scientist article, because based on how it's being presented in this video, it looks like New Scientist is agreeing that animals can tweak their genomes to adapt to new environments with some kind of determinism. But then I went and read it, and wouldn't you know, no change to the genome, just the epigenome. So this doesn't help either. I guess that brings us up to, what, zero for nine? Darn it, I had such high hopes. So this car is a totally autonomous car. It has all kinds of what? What are these things? Sensors. And guess what's inside of it? Computers doing what? Logic. And it can drive itself from San Francisco if it had a big enough gas tank to New York City going around hazards, going around bad weather, going around all kinds of things. Well, these, these, these guinea pigs do the same thing. Guinea pigs tw beat climate change by tweaking their own DNA. Yep, with methylation tags, not induced mutations. And as this article notes, this is only a temporary solution. And to adapt to the likely future extent of climate change, it will require actual changes to the genome of the guinea pigs not just changes to the epigenome. The problem is that those mutations may not come fast enough 
because in terms of Earth history, the current change in climate is happening orders of magnitude faster than in the past. They took these male guinea pigs, okay, the males are back on the hot seat, in this case literally, and they put these male guinea pigs in cages with a heating pad on the bottom of it to mimic climate change. Well, if you know anything about male guinea pig anatomy, what's sitting on the hot plate? Balls. It is. And they, they roasted them for 70 days, a long enough time to make one cycle of sperm. They mated these male guinea pigs with female guinea pigs, which were not in hot conditions. They looked at the pups. Lo and behold, the pups have modifications to the expression of at least 18 different genes that enable them to live in a hotter environment. And none to the genes themselves. Randy just can't stop shooting himself in the foot. Hmm, one generation. Do you think these male guinea pigs have a temperature sensor? Do you think they have logic? Do you think they have output? Of course. So we're looking for corresponding system elements on top of that. We're looking for the sensors that are all over your cells, all over your body. We're looking for innate logic, which we find in the nucleus and other places, and we're looking for appropriate adjustments all across the board. But it's that last one that's causing the problem. Look, it's not like there's nothing to epigenetics and phenotypic plasticity being important ways in which organisms quickly change and adapt to survive a rapid change in the environment. But the problem is that it's not enough. We know, for example, that organisms in the Lensky experiment have changed their genome considerably. This has to be accounted for. Humans have actually gone and identified the specific mutations and when they occurred in that experiment. We can't just hand wave them away with papers showing no change to the genome of the organisms in question. That's a losing strategy, and the thing is, other creationists know it. Jason Lyle has a two-part series all about how wrong Randy Galuza is on this, and he used to work for ICR. In fact, I suspect he left ICR because he didn't want to be associated with this nonsense. But it's not just Jason Lyle. Answers in Genesis knows that natural selection is real. Even Kent Hovind, who is basically the bottom of the procreationist barrel, understands that natural selection is real. When even the other creationists think your ideas are bonkers, it's probably time to pack it in. Therefore, if we want to approach biology from an engineering standpoint, which there's no reason to do, knowing how design things operate, oh, that would be so good if every biologist had to take Engineering 101. And as soon as we see the organisms of this world being engineered in the wild, I'll consider that a good idea too. Here's the, here's the obvious question. Why aren't biologists sent to Engineering 101? Because there's no evidence biological systems have been or are being engineered except by humans in laboratories, and only starting very recently. Because they don't believe it was what? Engineered. That's why they don't go to it. Yep. But I'm suggesting Knowing how design things operate can greatly inform our understanding of how living things operate. We would do it faster, we would do it more efficiently, we would do it with less cost. And that, just like this space shuttle, as I mentioned last night, which is going to transverse for through all of the different environments, has its solutions built in right from the beginning, we should expect the same thing in creatures. And they often do, just for different reasons. In this case, it's because the mutations that will be beneficial in a new environment already exist, so the population can quickly adapt to changes. The problem is that mutations aren't designed or deterministic, so this doesn't help the creationist side at all. That they will have their solutions built in right up front. Therefore, prediction time. When it comes time to figure out how these anticipatory systems work, what am I predicting? Well, one thing is this. Their capacity, just like the capacity on anything, is going to be fully internal. I'm not saying 99%, I'm saying 100%. 100% of the ability of these anticipatory systems is going to be found within the organisms, highly regulated by control systems. And the fact that some bacteria in the Luria Dilbrick experiment never adapted to the antibiotic means that this idea has already been falsified for like eight decades. The an organism will relate to its environment by its built-in control systems. That's a prediction of what we're going to find. 
I like that we got predictions. Too bad that the other predictions of this idea have already been known to be incorrect since before the idea was proposed. This is seriously like someone coming along and telling you about their hot new theory of fire called phlogiston theory. Then I point out that, no, that's been replaced by oxygen theory for a very long time. At this point, the person points to a bunch of experiments that confirm that oxygen is indeed the thing that makes flammable things burn, and says, ha, checkmate, oxygenist. This man here, he's passed away. He was, at the time, the world's leading researcher on anticipatory systems. He did a good job of describing what one was. He says, an anticipatory system is a natural system that contains, okay, this is really good, an internal predictive model of itself and its environment. That is really cool. That means it has an internal system that can model what? Itself and model what? Its environment. It's modeling them both in its where? Inside. Inside. Which allows it to change state in what? an instant in accord with the model's predictions pertaining to a later instant. So it's making a model which is predicting what's going to happen in the future, but it's changing itself now. That is really cool. It is really cool, and we know that some organisms meet that definition as individuals, but Randy needs them to meet that definition as populations. Randy basically can't figure out the difference between mental foresight, population mechanics, genetic mutation, and variation, epigenetic phenomena, and phenotypic plasticity. All of these things are just swimming around like a fever dream in Randy's mind, and just like in a dream, he picks out parts that only relate to his own imagination and smashes them together in ways that don't make any sense, don't explain anything, and which only sound plausible because his audience has no idea about the biology he's talking about. So, are we going to find this within creatures? Yes. Based on this research that they had done, they found that locusts, grasshoppers, dragonflies, and flies seem to use what? Internal models of the surrounding world to tailor their actions adaptively to predict the imminent future. Yep, which determines things like how they move their legs in response to likely outcomes in the next few seconds. It has nothing to do with creating new genetic variations in response to potential future environments. This paper is perhaps the least relevant thing to that topic that has been in the video. Really, go ahead and read it. Let me know if you can draw any relevance from this to the phenomenon of populations adapting to new environments that require genetic changes. Hmm. Where are the models? Nobody knows. I would think inside the brains of the animals in question. They are cognitive models, after all. But I'm predicting they're going to be there. So is everyone else. And on top of that, evidence of an internal model at the neural circuit level has also been shown in fruit flies. These examples highlight an important aspect of internal models whereby the state of the system should modulate the processing of sensory information. So where might we turn to look for things that we're going to find? Well, if we know how man-made things work, maybe it'll give us a clue about the biology. Well, here's, a, here's one. Humans have put together systems to, systems to model the weather. Well, if we were to look at one of these weather models, we would find four things in a weather model. First, somebody, probably some physicist, came up with mathematical equations characterizing the physics of natural phenomena. In other words, they studied clouds, <clears throat> and they made up physical models in math to model what clouds do, wind does, humidity does, temperature does, all of these things, some physicist, we get it, move to another point. Second, all over the world, they put up weather stations which gather data. As long as they don't gather lore. Three, they store in data banks what has happened in the weather in the past. Previous data is important because it's what came before. And then four, they put together these incredible equations which are able, as they say, to step forward in time and establish initial conditions. So they've got the models, 
They've got the real-time data that they're collecting. They've got all the historical data that they've stored up, and they're putting it together, and they're predicting what's going to happen next week. Yep, that's the kind of thing we call science. And the thing is, I already did that in this series. I tested Randy's idea against actual data, and it came up short. Why hasn't Randy bothered to do the same? Well, it's because he's not interested in science. He's interested in sciency sounding nonsense that will convince his co-religionists not to move away from his particular theological brand, and also to keep money coming into his institute. Okay, what am I predicting are going to be in creatures? Guess what they think? They're going to have these things. I predict that when we reverse engineer these creatures and we start to really figure out what's happening in their anticipatory systems, we're going to find programs equations. We're going to, we know that they have sensors, which are taking in data all the time. I'll bet we're going to find there's some stored reference information and there's mechanisms which enable them to step forward in time. Yeah, probably. But still, this is about individual organisms. We need to be talking about populations if this is to relate to evolution. Because evolution, whether it be universal common descent or just diversification of the alleged kinds after the flood, is a population phenomenon, not a thing that happens to or is performed by individual organisms. This is a fundamental category error. This is flat earth level argumentation right now. This is basically the same as saying that since a spirit level is flat, and since the horizon is level, then the earth is flat. It shows a complete ignorance or willingness to ignore the most basic facts about the ideas and theories one is arguing against. There you go. I say creationists don't make predictions. These are predictions. They are predictions. They're just not predictions that evolution wouldn't make. So they can't be used to distinguish between evolution and young earth creation. They're neutral on that one. In fact, not only the predictions, if ICR had the money and we had the staff, I would say this would be a great research program, wouldn't it? This would be a wonderful research program. So it's telling us what we're going to do. And it would show how organisms continuously track environmental changes, not only in real time, but proactively. And then we'll need to see them then using that tracking to induce mutations in their offspring or their own bodies, including their germline. But that's it. After this, it's just him hawking his humble wares. Well, that was a frustrating mess of internal incoherence. I want to say a special thanks to Dr. Dan Sturden Cardinal for helping me with this, including by giving me a short video of his to use. Please do go subscribe to him. He deserves your attention. If you like this video, please remember to hit like, subscribe, and turn on all notifications. Also, make sure you leave a comment. Even if you hated the video, you can tell me what's wrong with it. Either way, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. The people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.